I was actually born in, in Japan, some of you have asked, and when I was two years old, our family moved briefly to New York City, and then we moved to London, England for five years. And then when I was about eight years old, we, we moved to Vancouver, British Columbia. And after I had completed my undergrad studies, I returned to Tokyo. And as Steve mentioned, I worked for the Sony Corporation. And while I was there, as Steve also mentioned, he's pretty much read the whole message. <laughs> I, I met this young woman named Sakiko, fell in love, and eventually we got married. And we were planning to live in Vancouver, but we were going to be married in Tokyo. And so the night before our wedding, I'm out to dinner with her dad, my future father-in-law. And partway through the dinner, he leans over and he asks me the question, you know, after you're married, would it be possible for my daughter to occasionally visit us here in Japan? And that question might surprise you, but my father-in-law is a very traditional Japanese man, and he figured that if it inconvenienced me in any way for my wife to be gone, that I wouldn't let her return home and, and see her family. So I responded, yeah, by, by all means. And in my mind, I thought every year at New Year's, we'll try to go back to Japan because New Year's is a big deal in Japan, just like Christmas is here. And so if I'm back in Japan, you know, seeing my in-laws on New Year's Eve or around that time of year, I'm typically wide awake at two in the morning because of the time difference. I'm awful when it comes to jet lag. And sometimes I wonder what it would have been like if our family hadn't moved from Japan when I was two years old, if I'd been raised there. And I think of the enormous pressure that I would have been under to get into the right preschool, no kidding, and then to be admitted into the right kindergarten, and the pressure I would have faced to get into the right elementary school to pass that exam for that school and the right junior high and so forth. And eventually, the pressure to get picked up by the right company and to become a dutiful, quote, salary man, meaning soldier in the corporate world. And then I breathed this sigh of relief, thinking to myself, thank God that I don't live in such a relentless rat race. But if I am honest with myself and with you, I still feel the burden to achieve. I've been out of school for a while. I mean, I'm here at school, but I'm not here at school school, obviously. But I still have nightmares of being a student again. I'm facing down some exam in French or math, and I'm totally unprepared. Or there are times in life where I feel this real pressure to perform, much like I did when I played competitive basketball way back in high school. And that pressure followed me into my work with Sony. And when I became a pastor, which is considered a, quote, more spiritual and less competitive vocation, I found that I hadn't escaped the feeling that I needed to make something exceptional of my life and ministry. Now, ambition is a good thing. Ambition can get us up in the morning, push us out the door, energize us to learn a new skill for our job, to improve our sport, music, art. It can motivate us to make this world a place that more reflects the beauty and justice of Jesus Christ. But when our hunger to achieve is driven by a need to be accepted and respected, to prove that we have accomplished enough that we are enough, then ambition becomes distorted and life becomes a grind. Ambition, tenacity, and grit are great things. But when we feel compelled to do something to prove our worth, then life becomes burdensome. And if you have ever felt the burden of needing to achieve something in order to show that you are enough in some way, you know what a heavy weight that can be. And Jesus has some good news for you tonight. He has some very good news. He says in Matthew 11, 
28 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. Loving Father, through the Spirit, we pray that you would help us respond to the invitation of Jesus and come to him. That we might experience his good gift. And as we cited earlier from Psalm 103, that we would know what it is to experience our youth renewed like the eagles. That our life is redeemed from the pit and crowned with your love and compassion. And as that happens, as we recited earlier in the service, may we say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. And we pray these things in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. So we just read these words of Jesus from the gospel, but let's hear them once more. Hear the gospel. Hear Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, if you have ever felt weary or burdened, Jesus is saying, come. And I will give you rest. Literally, I will rest you. How so? Jesus says, by receiving my yoke, take my yoke upon you. Now, when Jesus uses the word yoke here in the text, he, of course, is referring to a wooden bar that was placed on the back of an ox, enabling the ox to pull a heavy weight a little more easily. And so Jesus here in this passage is comparing us to an ox. Now, for those of us who are Canadians, we know that our national animal is the beaver. Maybe not the coolest animal, but beavers are industrious and they're good at making dams. If you're American, your animal is an eagle. Very cool, especially when it soars. <laughs> But Jesus here doesn't compare us to an industrious beaver or a soaring eagle, but an ox. It's not very flattering, but it's apt because we too are weighted down by all kinds of burdens and anxieties. And when Jesus first spoke these words in first century Palestine, his hearers would have been living in a subsistence, day-to-day -day agrarian economy, and many of them would have wondered, where will my food come from tomorrow? That's why Jesus taught them to pray, give us this day our daily bread. The parents in his audience would have been concerned about the well-being of their children in a Roman empire where most newborns didn't live to see the age of 20. And you and I also have concerns about money, and health, but we also can feel burdened by whether we are accomplishing enough, whether we are enough, in a way that wouldn't have been felt as keenly in the first century world where most people's lot was determined by the family they were born into and their life circumstances. And so when Jesus says to us, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. He's also talking to those of us who have felt tired and burdened by the need to accomplish something to show that we are enough. And he says, come. Come to me and I will give you rest. Literally, I will rest you. 
And in those words, Jesus is not making a demand when he says come, but he is tendering an offer. Harvey Pinnock was a golf coach, and way back in the 1920s, he bought a red spiral-bound notebook and began to jot down his observations of the game of golf. Didn't show anyone his red notebook except his son until he was in his 80s, when he showed it to a local writer and asked this writer, do you think it's worth publishing? The writer took it away, read it, came back to Harvey and said, yes, I think it's worth publishing. Well, the next day, the writer left a message with Harvey's wife saying that Simon & Schuster has agreed to publish it with an advance of $90,000. Well, the next time the author saw Harvey Pinnock, he noticed that Harvey looked really troubled and worried. And the author said, what's, what's the matter, Harvey? And Harvey said, well, you know, I really want my book to be published, but I'm in a stage of life where I have all kinds of medical expenses and all kinds of bills. I can't afford the $90,000 advance to get this book published. <laughs> and the writer said, no, 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 Harvey, that's not the way it works. Simon & Schuster is offering you an advance payment of $90,000 to have the rights to publish your book. Harvey thought that the publisher was making a demand when the publisher was making an offer. And when Jesus says, come, he's not making a demand. He's making an offer. Now, of course, there is a cost to following Jesus. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the Lutheran pastor during World War II who opposed Hitler, famously said that following Christ involves costly grace. It's costly because it will cost a person their life, but it is grace because it will give a person their only true life. And when Jesus says, come, he's making an offer for us to experience a better life, not necessarily an easier one, but our only true life. How so? Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Literally, I will rest you. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And as I mentioned, when Jesus uses the word yoke here, he's referring to this wooden bar that's placed on the back of an ox, enabling it to better pull that heavy load. Now, some of you here may be thinking, in order to rest, I do not need a yoke. As the weather's getting warmer here in Toronto, I need a hammock or a massage at the spa or an all-expense-paid vacation to the Caribbean, not a yoke. But Jesus paradoxically says, no, if you really want to rest, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Why does Jesus say that? He says that because he knows that you and I tend to wear the wrong yokes. The heavy yoke of our own self-expectation or perhaps the expectation of a parent, or of a teacher, a boss, even the expectation in some cases of a friend or a spouse, or perhaps even the expectation of our former classmate that we're planning to meet at our class reunion and we can't even remember their name. <laughs> now some of you may be saying, well, I'll take option C, no yoke for me. But Jesus teaches that there are no yokeless people, that we were made to be yoked to something or someone. Have you ever woken up in the morning and felt really groggy and still sleepy? And there was a part of you that felt like, oh, I wish I could be free of gravity and just float to the bathroom. <laughs> you know what happens to astronauts when they are in some space station where gravity is absent? Their muscles actually begin to atrophy and they begin to experience premature osteoporosis because you and I were actually made 
to live with gravity. And according to scripture, you and I were designed to be yoked to something or someone. There are no yokeless people. And so what is the thing in your life that you are yoked to? And if some of you here are, are students here at Wycliffe or maybe some other school, if you're a student, maybe you feel the heavy yoke of needing to get good grades or to do well at school. And it's especially true in a place like Toronto or anywhere on the East Coast. So, but people in Toronto, you don't, you don't really consider yourself East Coasters. Do you, do, is that a term that you use? That's more like further East than U.S., right? So, you know, some years ago, I was invited to teach at one of the Christian fellowships at Harvard. And as I was being picked up from my hotel, uh, driven to campus, I, I asked the student leader, can you give me some advice about speaking to the students? And uh, the student leader said, yeah. Harvard students really struggle with feeling significant. I said, really? I figured, you know, if you got admitted to Harvard, I, I could never get into Harvard, that you'd have all your self-esteem issues solved. <laughs> He said, it's not, like that way. it's not that way at all here. There are so many talented people that it's really hard to stand out. You know, some folks feel the, the heavy yoke of, of needing to be with Ms. Wright or, or Mr. Wright. Back when I was in, in grade six, I remember going roller skating with some of my friends to the Stardust uh, roller skating rink. Uh, not far from my home. And uh, there was someone at the rink that we considered the goddess. Uh, she had, uh, yeah, I was hearing the music, you know, <laughs> literally and metaphorically. And uh, you know, she had long, wavy blonde hair. She resembled a popular model at the time, a younger version of someone named Christy Brinkley. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she could skate forwards, backwards, you know, jump and twirl like a figure skater. And my friends wanted to ask her to, to do a couple skate, meaning to hold hands and do a kind of a slow skate around, you know, the, 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 the rink to, to kind of a slow dance song. And they were all too afraid to ask her. And, you know, back in grade six, I was pretty socially confident. In fact, that was probably my all-time social peak. <laughs> it's been downhill ever since. So I, I remember skating up to her and, and literally physically looking up to her. She might have been two or three years older than me, and I, I, my confidence was just ebbing away. It was a bad sign. And I asked her, do you want to do like a couple skate? She looked down at me, no. <laughs> and my little grade six heart was crushed. And I can laugh about it now, but you know, when I got a little older into my dating years, it was, it was important for me to try to date someone who was glamorously attractive as, as a way to try to validate myself. And you know, some people feel that they only have significance if they're with Ms. Wright or, or, or Mr. Wright. Some people wear the, the heavy yoke of feeling like they need to accomplish something impressive at work in their careers in order to be somebody. Pico Iyer wrote an essay in the New York Times and he said, in the corporate world, I always knew there was some higher position I could attain, which meant that like Zeno's arrow, I was guaranteed never to arrive and always to remain dissatisfied. Do you ever feel that if you could only attain that position or that honor that you would finally feel better about yourself? I don't know if you've seen the, uh, the movie Cool Runnings or not, but uh, it's, you've seen, uh, it's loosely based on the attempt of, this, um, this, is, not a, uh, an ox, this is not like a, a mistake in the, in the, in the um, presentation, it's gonna sound bizarre, but the Jamaican bobsledding team <laughs> to qualify and compete at the 1988 Calgary Olympic Games. And so the star bobsledder for the Jamaican team is this guy named Darius. And he feels that if he can only win a gold medal, 
that people will finally respect him and that his life will be deemed successful. Well, the night before the, the final race, Darius is in his room carefully studying the course layout when his coach, who has won two gold medals, walks in on him and senses how driven Darius is. And the coach says, Darius, winning a gold medal is a wonderful thing. But if you're not enough without the gold medal, you won't be enough with the gold medal. Winning the gold medal is a wonderful thing. But if you're not enough without it, you'll never be enough with it. I wanted to test that assumption out. And so we, we were together at a um, World Vision meeting earlier this year, back in January, and uh, Ashton Eaton, the Olympic gold medalist, uh, was, was speaking, and, and I spoke after him and his Canadian wife, Brianne Thiessen Eaton. Ashton won a gold medal in the decathlon at the Rio Games last year. He also won the gold medal in the decathlon four years before at the London Olympics. Is the current world record holder in the decathlon. And so this past week, knowing I was speaking here on Ambition, I Skyped him and I said, Ashton, what do you think about this, this statement? And he'd seen the movie. Winning the gold medal is a nice thing, but if you're not enough without it, you won't be enough with it. And Ashton, without hesitation, said, the coach is 100% right. And he said it was nice winning the gold medal. It was like the cherry on top of the sundae. But you know, after I won it, to be honest, and I'm not sure if he'll say this on the record or off the record, but I think he said it on the record. Uh, got Mary here, who's, uh, Sue, uh, who's a writer. Um, he said it felt a little superficial, the medallion itself. Because the real value of the Olympics for me was not winning the gold medal, but was an opportunity for me to do my very best. And I followed up and I said, Ashton, um, you know, you've won two gold medals. You're the world record holder in the decathlon and the heptathlon. Do you sort of feel like you've accomplished enough in life and that you can just sort of take a deep breath? I, I knew that he had retired fairly recently from athletics. He said, no, not at all. I've got another goal to, to pursue. I've got another hill to climb. That's behind me now. Sometimes we wonder. I mean, some of you are young. Some of you are, you know, more in your more mature years. But if we only have this accomplishment, we'll feel like that's enough. Now, as an Asian Canadian, I'm, as a Japanese Canadian, I'm reluctant to, to talk about my own accomplishments at work uh, for fear of seeming immodest. And, and so what I'm about to say, I don't say to impress you, but to impress upon you the fact that I'm just like you are. As uh, St Steve alluded to earlier, I didn't go into a lot of detail, but when I first became uh, the pastor there in Vancouver of 10th Church, uh, the, the church had gone from over 1,000 people to 100 and something. It had cycled through 20 ministers in, in 20 years. And I felt really anxious about the challenge before me. In fact, the secretary of the church one day walked into my office and, when I was new, and she said, Ken, um, if the ship sinks now, everyone's going to blame you because you were the last captain at the helm. <sighs> I think she was trying to motivate me to work harder. I, I just felt terrible afterwards. But you know, through the grace of God, in the last two decades, it's reemerged as a large, multi-ethnic, vibrant church. Uh, Steve mentioned that I, I wrote a book uh, that I didn't even think was going to be uh, published. And it ended up being an international bestseller, and you know, all the proceeds are going to missions like World Vision that work with vulnerable kids. So I'm really, I'm really happy and grateful for that. And some of you are going to enter into pastoral ministry one day, and, and maybe you see some hills on the horizon, but should you ascend those hills with God's help, if you don't feel like you're enough before you're at the mountaintop, you won't feel like you're enough when you're on it. And some of us who are our parents, we feel the yoke of, oh, how are my kids going to turn out? 
If my kids are okay, I'll feel like I'm okay. And Jesus says this to us in the text. If you feel burdened and weary, you're wearing the wrong yoke. You're wearing the yoke, the yoke of your, your own self-expectation or maybe your parents or someone important in your life. And he's saying, throw down that yoke. Switch yokes and wear my yoke. So what is Jesus' yoke? What is the yoke that he's referring to here in the passage? Well, as you Wycliffe students no doubt know, when you don't understand what a word means, what is the interpretive king? It's context, right? Context is king insofar as interpretation is concerned. And so what does Jesus mean when he says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light? I think it means light. I think it means it's going to be pleasant on our neck, on our back. I think it also means in the context that this is well, let's look at the context. Jesus, in the passage preceding, is praising his Father in heaven because God has revealed the most important eternal truths, not necessarily to the best and the brightest, but to children and to those who come to him with the humility of a child. And Jesus here is basking in the wonder of his Father and in the gift of his Father's love for him. So what is the yoke of Jesus in the context? The yoke of Jesus is something that's going to feel pleasant on your neck. It's going to feel life-giving. It is the yoke of his Father's love for him. Before Jesus ever preached a single sermon or baptized a single individual, like John was baptizing people, or performed a miracle, God the Father said of him, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And before you have accomplished anything in school, in career, in your family life, God says, I want to place the yoke of my love on your shoulders. So if you're wearing a heavy yoke of self-expectation, or the expectation of someone else. Jesus is saying, switch yokes, shuck your yoke, and wear my yoke, the yoke of my Father's love, uniquely designed for you. What if the yoke that God wants to give us doesn't weigh us down, but instead lifts us up? What a difference that would make. You know, some, some time ago, a friend of mine who has a kind of prophetic gift uh, said, Ken, I think God has something he wants to say to you. So I kind of leaned in. I was interested. My ears perked up. And he said, this is what I sense God saying to you. For a long time, you have felt like you've needed to be, quote, the guy. You know, when you were younger, the guy on the sports field. When you were a younger man, the guy in the business world. And now you feel like you need to be the guy as the pastor. And here's what I sense God saying to you. Ken, you don't need to be the guy. You just need to be the son. And I began to tear up, even though, you know, we Asians are not supposed to show any public emotion, at least guys aren't, because I felt this enormous weight lifting off of my shoulders in that moment that I don't need to be the, the guy. I just need to be the son. And God is saying to some of you, you don't need to be the guy. You just need to be the son. Or you don't need to be the girl. You just need to be the daughter. And we've been talking about identity today. Identity is not something you achieve but it's something you receive as a gift from a father who loves you. It's a gift. My mentor for more than 20 years is a man named Leighton Ford. 
He's a Christian minister originally from Ontario, from Chatham. He's the brother-in-law of Billy Graham, a name that you might recognize. I first got to know Leighton when I was a seminary student in the Boston area. And during that time, I also enrolled in something called the Arrow Leadership Program. I was actually in the pilot class. And as one of my classmates recalled at a recent reunion last month, when the 25 of us came together for the first time, it was like one of the opening scenes in the movie Top Gun that Chris Lake referred to, like we were looking sideways at our rivals, wondering how we stacked up against each other. Well, I was one of the youngest in the class, certainly the least experienced and accomplished in Christian ministry. And, and I was really anxious to, to impress Slayton because I didn't want him to feel like my admission into the program had been a mistake or that his investment in me was some kind of mistake. But during the second or third residential, I can't remember all the context, but Leighton looked at me with his piercing blue eyes, and he simply said, Ken, I, I admire you. And I remember that feeling really special, and it didn't take long for me to realize that Leighton didn't care for me. He didn't love me because of my, quote, potential, or because I could do something for his organization or the larger world of, quote, Christian ministry. I found that his commitment to me was unwavering in the midst of all of my limitations, vulnerabilities, and failures. 25 years later, I feel more loved and at home in Leighton's presence than I ever have before. And so I feel completely free to be transparent about my struggles and temptations, as well as to share the joys of my heart without inhibition. And it's not like I, I, I no longer want to make something out of my life in ministry in part to honor his investment in me, but it doesn't come from a place of desperately needing to be validated, but rather out of a deep sense of gratitude for Leighton's love for me. Come on in. And so it can be in our relationship with God our Father in heaven. As we recognize His love for us, as we allow Him to place the yoke of His unique love on our shoulders, which is often clear to us and made deep in our hearts through the ancient practices of Sabbath keeping, which I'll talk about tomorrow morning. And as Krista talked about, the practices of solitude and silence and gratitude and walking through the woods. And, and I outlined some of these practices in the book that Steve mentioned, God in My Everything, How an Ancient Rhythm Helps Busy People Enjoy God. It's available in Crux. And if you can't afford a copy, I've got my credit card here somewhere. I'm glad to gift you with copy. That's not, no joke. So. Uh, and when we realize that we are loved by our Father, it's not like we don't want to make something out of our life and, and the work of our heart and hands, but we're no longer motivated out of a need to be accepted, but rather out of gratitude for the fact that we are accepted. Have you accepted the fact that you are accepted? You know, God is calling you to great things. Not necessarily glamorous and widely known things, but great in the sense that they're designed to come uniquely through your beautiful personhood and profoundly shape some lives around you. But these things are to be motivated not out of a manic need to prove that you are enough, but out of the confidence and wonder that comes from knowing that you are enough already in the eyes of the only person who matters. And so you can experience God as alive and real, not only when you pray or enter into a space like this to engage in formal acts of worship, but you can know God is alive and real in every part of your life, including your ambition. When you are yoked to your Father's love, you can be a person full of ambition and healthy security, 
a person full of grit and grace. Let's pray together. Do you hear uh, the invitation of Jesus to you anew when he says, come? Come to me and let me yoke you to my Father's unique love for you. And if you hear that voice, Will you simply pray in your heart, Father, would you help me to see how high and deep and how long and wide is your love for me in Christ Jesus? And as your heart awakens to that love, despite the pressures you may feel in your outer world, may you feel light and free. As Krista said, may you move into that happy space where in your spirit you are dancing because your Father sings over you and rejoices over you. Would you pray that you would realize that you don't need to be the guy You just need to be the son. You don't need to be the girl. You just need to be the daughter. And we pray these things in the name of a Father who loves us, a Son who redeems us, and a Holy Spirit who leads us into a place of deep rest in Sabbath. Amen.